Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Jason Fox. I'm the uh, um, Senior Technical Evangelist at the Fireware Foundation, and we are continuing our series of regular Wednesday webinars with uh, a session, of, in fact, the start of uh, several sessions on uh, new features in NGSI LD. Uh, the, uh, specifically today, we're talking about the uh, NGSI LD temporal interface, which has also been expanded uh, in, the, in the latest release of the uh, um, uh, specification from uh, Etsy. So uh, let's get on and find out what we're going to be doing today. Um, today we're going to be covering the following. We're going to be using, uh, covering the uh, um, temporal functions which uh, have been defined, they've been defined uh, probably since the very first uh, uh, NGSI LD specification, but specifically we're talking about the ones which uh, uh, it defined the 131 uh, Etsy spec. The, uh, um, the point here is that the vast majority of brokers are currently following uh, 131. So 141 is kind of, you know, taster as to what's coming uh, coming later. But so we've got temporal functions. Uh, temporal functions uh, have a variety of output formats. So we'll see the normalized and simplified uh, output formats. And of course, there are a variety of uh, function calls you will be able to make to uh, um, uh, change the output. So uh, we'll be able to covering things like filtering and pagination and what have you. Now, um, after the demo, uh, there'll be a little bit on the, um, the latest uh, uh, changes, which is the um, temporal aggregation functions. Uh, at the moment, because this is uh, really new stuff, uh, I don't think there's a, a compliant broker yet, but obviously, because it's in the uh, um, specification, it is agreed that this is the way that brokers will do it. Now, um, one interesting question which comes up quite a lot is why do you need a temporal interface or when do you need a temporal interface? Because we've already got uh, historical persistence uh, um, components. Uh, we've already got um, uh, short time history components. So there is a difference between the two. And there's reasons why you'd want to use one and why you'd want to use the other. So that will also be covered uh, at, at the end to work out what we're doing and what we're not doing. It will, I'll mention um, anti-patterns. I'll mention uh, what you were, um, when you should prefer one over, one over the other. A little bit of background. Um, the uh, NGS ILD uh, tutorials uh, are based on a, uh, a smart farm uh, scenario. And um, that's what, what I'm going to be uh, um, uh, showing today. So you've got to imagine that you are a, an agricultural small holding and you're raising cows and pigs. And obviously, each animal is worth between 500 and 800 euros. Uh, so it's worthwhile um, protecting your investment. So uh, every uh, animal will be wearing a device, uh, an animal collar of some sort. Um, so we can work out you know, where they are, whether they're uh, um, uh, uh, stressed because they've got a high heart rate, or and also, you know, what are they actually up to? Um, the goal of any um, smart system based on fireware, obviously, is to improve productivity. And uh, you can uh, uh, imagine a situation where getting this information and being able to understand how healthy are my animals? Do I need to call the vet? Do I not need to call the vet yet because actually it's a false positive? And vets cost money. Uh, this is going to uh, um, obviously affect my bottom line. So you've got to think at the end of the day, whenever you're creating a smart system, you are dealing with uh, a, uh, a commercial enterprise and we've got to be able to do something worthwhile. If you're wondering what the, uh, the, the graphic is, this is uh, again from the uh, uh, NGSI LD 141 uh, specification. This, uh, a, uh, a GeoJSON output, and that is just pure GeoJSON of my cows uh, in my field. And you can see I've got one uh, um, uh, adult cow who's got a heart rate of 51, uh, and uh, um, her name is Happy. So uh, you can work out uh, what the state of the system is. Obviously, with the um, uh, entities, you're talking about how the animal is right now, whereas with the Temporal interface, you've actually started to get some sort of history of what the animal is doing, had, has been doing, and where they've been, and uh, and uh, so forth, and so, uh, so on and so forth. So imagine we're building one of these uh, these systems. Where will we start? Well, we're talking NGSI LD. So the thing you need to start with 
any NGSI LD system is you need to start with your implementation specific context. So, okay, what uh, um, sort of uh, attributes, what sort of entities have we got in the system? Well, I've picked a few of the, uh, uh, the more important ones here. We have device, we have animal, we have uh, the species of the animal, the sex of the animal, the heart rate of the animal, the location of the animal. Um, but the point here, of course, is that um, when you're building one of these systems, you've got to think, how am I going to be in a position such that I could potentially share this data with others later on? That's the whole point about the LD, linked data, is that you are giving computers a chance to understand uh, each other. And it's important here because um, we have defined a interface, a temporal interface, which is common amongst brokers. So then you have a common way into the data and a common way of displaying the, uh, the data so that an external system is able to uh, understand it. So what we're doing here uh, is um, we say, OK, where am I going to find some uh, 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 common data models on uh, uh, agri-food? Well, there's the uh, Smart Data Models in uh, initiative, IUDX, uh, uh, you know, TM Forum, various others who are uh, um, coming together saying this is something which is in use. This is something which is uh, um, uh, common to things which are already out there. So, OK, we'll have things like animal, device, part field and what have you. Um, if you want to have a look at the full context, indeed, if you want to uh, follow on with the uh, um, uh, um, tutorial as a whole, then um, uh, everything's available on GitHub under the uh, um, tutorial short term history NGSILD branch. Um, the uh, um, informa the uh, uh, information and all the uh, um, uh, requests I'll be making. So, temporal functions. The difference between an entity, which is the current state of a single entity, which is just slash entities and the URN and a temporal request is that obviously it's a different endpoint. Um, te the temporal endpoint is um, an optional add-on to the uh, context brokers. Um, reason why it's optional is that um, obviously maintaining a history of uh, uh, entities is going to uh, take processor, it's going to take storage space, it might not be relevant. If I'm talking about my farm buildings, farm buildings don't move around very much, they haven't got much state. If our system was purely based on buildings, we might not need uh, a, a, a temporal system. Um, however, um, obviously, in this particular case, we have a, a system where we have living animals who are li moving around, moving around the system, they've got a, a change of state, and we want to be able to get hold of not only just the state of the entity, which is what a context broker would normally do, but also get hold of the uh, um, uh, history of that entity. Now, if you look carefully, you'll notice that on the first request, this is uh, an Orion LD uh, request, it's looking on uh, port, ten, uh, port uh, 1026, whereas in the second one, it's on a uh, different port. It may or may not be the case that temporal entities are listing on a different port. Um, as it happens, uh, the example I'm, uh, I'm showing through Orion LD and Mintaka will be using a separate port. If I was using Scorpio, it would all be on the same port. Uh, it's just one of these things you need to be, uh, be uh, aware of. Uh, now, the default format is the normalized format. And obviously, a normalized format is going to come out in proper NGSI LD. And therefore, the context plus the core context will fully uh, define uh, the attributes of the system. So again, you need to link, always link back to the linked data, JSON linked data, uh, um, to work out yeah, what are the real long names of these things. If you look at the headers, you can see I've put uh, um, two headers in the uh, uh, um, in each request. First one is just saying what's the tenant, and in other words, who's uh, which system I'm talking because obviously uh, context brokers are multi-tenant. Uh, but the second one is is that long long. Uh, um, link header to uh, say this is where my app context is. Now, obviously, um, these uh, um, queries you could, if you uh, realistically, you could ask, give me everything I've got about this this animal cow one um, over the last whatever. But I've just got the last 
five uh, entries uh, here is the, is the uh, um, uh, in order to make the uh, responses a bit shorter. Um, obviously, these things get very long very quickly. They're not designed to be instantaneous. They can take a bit of time, um, particularly uh, your first request when obviously the context broker in question needs to get hold of the uh, app context. But the idea is that these are then uh, um, interoperable. So when you make this request, you would get back a uh, an, ent uh, an entity. And you can see here, um, I'm, I'm looking for Cal2, uh, and uh, I get back the ID and type, and I get back um, some but not all of the attributes. You can see on this particular example, I'm getting back uh, the heart rate and the location. And the reason why I'm getting the heart back and uh, heart rate and location is because both of these have a property of a property uh, within uh, uh, the data called observe that. Observe that is well defined in the uh, core context, which is the timestamp to be used when an event takes place. And obviously, if you're using uh, your IoT agents, uh, you can uh, it'll supply this by uh, by default. Um, and uh, it, you will also notice that observed at is a non-reified uh, attribute. In other words, it's uh, just uh, just got the uh, the value next to it. Now there are um, uh, you can have other properties of properties like provided by, which is just a uh, relationship. Um, it's uh, um, it, it's an object rather than just a, a simple string. But there are, as you can see at the top of uh, each uh, each entry, five. Uh, um, attributes which are very direct. You've got type, value, observe that, instance ID, and unit code. All of these are defined within the core context, and um, it means that the data is understandable by uh, the uh, uh, by the uh, system in question. Heart rate uh, is going to return an array of values which are going to have multiple uh, um, uh, entries. So the uh, the value of the heart rate will will change over time and it will have uh, when you observed at the timestamp and it's also got this thing called instance ID. Instance ID is uh, used in the advanced operations of the temporal interface to be able to delete stuff. You've got the right to forget uh, and it, being able to delete a specific value from the uh, database, a backing database uh, is, uh, is necessary. Um, similarly, uh, if you wanted to, you could possibly delete a property of a property or a relationship of a property. So things like provided by also has uh, an, uh, an instance ID. I won't be going into that today because um, that, those are rather advanced uh, uh, operations, but uh, it's something uh, to be aware of. The other uh, element that there, of course, is the, uh, uh, the unit code. The unit code is saying what the uh, um, value actually means. And the unit code, in this case, 5K, is going to be uh, uh, beats per minute because it's a heart rate. Obviously, a heart rate is actually not just a heart rate. If I go back to the previous, uh, oops, there we go, previous screen here, you can see a heart rate is actually a full long UR, uh, 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 URI. But actually, within my uh, within within my uh, um, response, because I've got this at context in there, I'm just getting uh, um, uh, short names back. Um, on the right hand side, you can see that you don't necessarily have to have uh, simple values. You can have objects which are changing. In this case, it's a geo property. And you can see that our uh, um, our cow is, is wandering around at various locations in the middle of Berlin uh, over uh, 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 over time. Now, um, there are when we come on to. Uh, uh, um, advanced operations, there are aggregation functions, and aggregation functions obviously work best um, when you're talking about uh, numbers. And of course, the vast majority of stuff which you will be uh, um, dealing with will be the number, you know, the uh, uh, reading I've got from uh, from this attribute, because this is when you're really going to want to use your, uh, um, uh, your, your uh, temporal operations. The, uh, um, there is another option, temporal values. If you can see here, the uh, temporal operations it can get quite large, very long, very quickly. But temporal values um, is uh, the equivalent of key values. You know, I'm sure you're, you're, uh, um, um, you're able to uh, uh, understand um, 
uh, what the uh, uh, standard operations are and the uh, key, value, key values version, it's a short form. It's not full NGSILD. It's not what you would use to talk between broker and broker. However, it is usable by applications uh, at the, at the uh, endpoint. And it's just give me the, re the, uh, the reading and a timestamp. And you can see here, it's the same uh, request as beforehand. I've just got another parameter, options equals temp uh, temporal values. And uh, I'll just show you what the, uh, the format looks like. The format is shorter, simple as that. You can see more values on there. Um, and it's just uh, a, a, an array of tuples. Now, um, once again, we have heart rate and location. And once again, within that heart rate object, that attribute, it says it's a property or a geo property or relationship or whatever. And then you've got this array, uh, which has got two dimensions. It's got the value and it's got the timestamp. Now, the timestamp, obviously, by default, is going to be the observed at. So you can see here from here, you've got the observed at heart rate and it's uh, um, changing over time. So if you want to uh, do something like um, display this cow's heart rate on uh, a graph, well, you've got all the information you need. And what's more, because uh, you've got the linked data information, you know that this heart rate is a heart rate. And, uh, and if you looked in the uh, um, uh, expanded at, uh, at context, you can actually find out, yes, this is uh, like to be beats per minute, blah, 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 and so on and so forth. Now, again, location, you can see the object uh, uh, com uh, comes in there. And this is something you could potentially use if you wanted to work out how far the animal uh, has, has moved, because obviously you could uh, find the distance from point one to point two, point three, point four, you could work out uh, what, what the distance is. Now that actually is a legitimate uh, use case for an uh, agricultural system because you could work out whether your uh, animal is healthy if they are uh, moving a certain distance a, a distance a day uh, or uh, potentially um, moving much less than the average for the herd or whatever. So this is actually um, getting data out in a useful way format. Now, not every attribute has got an observed at. If we go back to our, um, uh, our animals, uh, we've got uh, attributes like the sex of the animal. The sex of the animal is not changing, um, and therefore it's not necessary to um, observe that all the time. It's, it, it's a static value. It, it's just uh, useful for keying in. But we want to be able to find out, say, information about all the bulls in the herd, all the male animals, um, or we want to find out um, uh, about the pigs rather than the uh, r r rather than the uh, um, the cattle or whatever. And you can see um, that in order to do this, you uh, you need to expand the uh, what your uh, timestamp is uh, being used on. Rather than using the default timestamp, time property observed that you can use modified at now modified at is a slightly odd name because it doesn't necessarily mean it's modified it means it was when it was last observed uh, because um, if you think about it a context broker has got no history so if you send a value like seven down to a context broker then we know that you know the value is seven and then if you send it the same value a minute later we actually have some more information. We say not only is the value seven, but we know the value is seven a little bit later. So it's, it's more uh, um, valid um, uh, information. And this is actually um, what is meant by modified. Modified uh, includes the timestamp of the uh, um, uh, attribute, not just the value. So don't think about modifying the value. Obviously, the, uh, the sex of the animal is not changing, but you can uh, uh, add in, uh, additional uh, information. You can see here, I've added in a Q parameter. Um, this is the same as you would do if you were just to use the, uh, it's the same syntax as you use for the uh, um, uh, entities endpoints. Um, and uh, it's obviously got the uh, uh, the quotes uh, and I've, I've put that into uh, URI encoding and you can work out what the uh, uh, what happens. Now what happens when you have a modified app is that you get slightly more uh, uh, information in the response. Um, you get whatever you'd get for the uh, um, 
uh, heart rate because I'm, ask, I'm, I'm ask, asking for the heart rate. Uh, and of course, you get the modified app as well. So now you've got this uh, additional uh, attribute in the normalized version, obviously. Now, if you look carefully down at the sex, you'll notice that it's just an ordinary property. Um, uh, it was an ordinary property with a modified app, uh, uh, sub attribute. It is not an array. Now, this is because of the way that JSON LD works. JSON, uh, obviously, NGSI LD is a, um, a extended subset of um, uh, JSON LD. And uh, when you have a simple value, which is uh, uh, one element of an array, it will reduce it to a value. So what you have here is that sex is you can treat in the same fashion as you treat with the ID or the, uh, the type. In that there's only it's just like the standard entities. However, heart rate has got that uh, latest uh, information, and obviously um, uh, it will um, just return the the bull to the herd, the male the male animals to the herd, rather than uh, uh, return uh, everything else. Out. You should be aware that observed at and modified at are not necessarily the same, particularly for uh, slower moving systems like. Um, um, uh, agricultural systems, you could have a device which is supposed to have the battery life for the entire life of the animal. And therefore, it's only going to wake up periodically uh, and it's going to post uh, information, say, using uh, MQTT and then go to sleep for another 20 minutes. That might not be received at the uh, context broker uh, until a significant period of time has passed. So the modified app and the uh, Observe, observe that can be different. Now, you can see that on the uh, example, I've got the heart rate here. I've got a difference of about a second, but it could be a lot, a, a lot larger than that. Obviously, if you're talking about a faster moving system like a uh, production line, it's going to be a lot less. But you should be, should be aware that they are not the same as, uh, uh, as each other. Now, the nice thing about modify that is that every single attribute will have a modify that. So you can use modified app to expand your temporal requests to cover the static data. Let's have a look at this. In, let's have a look at this uh, uh, in action. I'll try and uh, get my little uh, little demo up and running. Um, there are uh, so, uh, this uh, uh, sample Docker Compose uh, on the uh, uh, Fireway GitHub, so you can actually start the, start these up. The um, in fact, there are multiple uh, Docker composers because this one uh, deals with uh, uh, Scorpio, it deals with Orion, blah, blah, blah. Um, now, um, the point here is that you should understand that from this diagram, the backing database, in this case, because I'm going to be using uh, Orion or because it's quicker to start up, um, in this case, the time scale, is not necessarily the same between different context brokers. If you were to use Scorpio, you'd be using Postgres with, uh, with Postgres. If you're using uh, Orion, you'd be using uh, TimescaleDB. DB. That might change uh, in a future future version. For all I know, it's not um, uh, necessarily the case that the memory is a a, a well exposed uh, um, uh, interface. Now, you could directly make requests to uh, uh, TimeScale. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you're better off uh, just looking at the uh, the data itself. You can see this is a, a relatively simple uh, add-on uh, um, uh, architecture. All we've got is we've got this additional uh, uh, component, Mintaka, which is uh, running in uh, um, combination with uh, the Orion Context Broker. Let's start up the uh, containers and see how whether we can get something to something to run. Now I've split my uh, um, Docker Compose into two parts because I want to make sure that the add-on is running before I'm starting. You can see this is just the uh, Mintaka component. You can see at the bottom half of the screen um, I'm uh, loading a year a year. Um, a time scale uh, database. I've got some various uh, uh, standard uh, um, attributes. Um, obviously, in any uh, secure system, I wouldn't put my username and password in clear text, but you've got the idea. It's just something sitting on the web and it's something I can access. Whatever 
username I'm putting into my system, I need to make sure that the uh, um, uh, Mintaka component has got the same name. So it's saying password is Orion, database is Orion, and it's a uh, time scale. Now, um, the number of uh, um, threads which you want to use, pool size, you could end up with starvation. So um, it's a good idea to uh, uh, make sure that you're not using too many uh, um, uh, threads at one time. I'm uh, putting in information like endpoint info enabled so I can actually uh, um, uh, do a health check, say, are you up? Are you running? Uh, and I need uh, obviously that may or may not be sensitive. Now let's see if I can see if we're running yet. Oh, it's still, still provisioning devices. Okay, so we're going to wait for wait for a uh, a short period whilst the uh, thing's actually loading up. Obviously, it's creating uh, the scenario I'm I'm talking about. It's created uh, thirty cows and pigs. Uh, it's linking devices. The uh, obviously we have a device which is recording the uh, um, the heart rate, but also we want to have the heart rate on the cow. So we need to be able to push that information uh, uh, elsewhere. Um, and now we're up and running. Right. OK, so let's start off by looking at our device monitor. Yeah, farm is, is currently asleep. Let's start our tractor. The tractor's now started to move. You can see we've now got various uh, um, pigs and cows. Uh, they're all, all at rest because they start off uh, uh, inside the barn. But uh, at, so, uh, at some point, you can see that uh, the uh, animals will start, uh, uh, like pig two is currently foraging, um, uh, they'll start changing their status. You will find that the uh, uh, location is moving slowly. And obviously, I've got a, uh, quite a large uh, cow. You can see all the pigs are coming through at the moment. Now, this is difficult to see on uh, with raw data coming through. So let's see what happens when I uh, actually make some re requests using my context broker. So I'll do the last three entities here. Um, prams, that's right. So let's see if, if Animal 2 has got some data in the system. It will take a little bit of time to begin with because obviously, like any NGIS ILD system, it doesn't know initially what the context is. So it's going to have to download the context data, um, which is um, a little bit here. Where are we? Um, I haven't got it here. Where's my context data? Yeah, you can see it's going to have to download my context. Um, and this has got all this information. It's uh, in a well-known, well-known, uh, well-known location. It takes a bit of time to process that. It does that once, of course. Uh, it then uh, would uh, um, purely uh, um, uh, cache that, and then next time I'm asking for the same context, it's uh, um, it doesn't have to do it again because of the nature of JSON LD. You could, in theory, have all this embedded inside your uh, your requests, so it gets rather complex. But the uh, the best way to do it, and indeed, if I show you the other um, thing here, is, is to have, say, a web server, like in this case, it's uh, Alpine, uh, which is just serving that, that file from a well-known public location. And it's uh, within this system, it, it's known as context. Um, so you can just uh, get hold of it. Now, again, looking at the um, Orion part of this, because uh, this is, this is split with an add-on. You can see here, again, we have the environment variables which are um, uh, um, saying, OK, I want to persist my data into a timescale database, and these are my username and password, which obviously shouldn't be in plain text, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, it is worthwhile mentioning that normally when I'm doing my demos, I would leave the uh, log level at debug. But of course, um, this is getting uh, a bit more uh, memory intensive. I've only got a small uh, um, uh, machine I'm running. Things can slow down quite uh, quite quickly. So I've, I've changed the debug level to error. Um, it's not really uh, a problem, but you can, uh, and indeed I've done it myself, um, uh, run into difficulties if you're uh, trying to do too much on one uh, particular system. So you want to containerize properly. You want to make everything do one little job. You want to use things like HTBD to uh, um, uh, do a separate uh, thread for doing the uh, um, uh, context and what have you. So where are we? I need to go back to this. So OK, so um, eventually after uh, it's returned back, 
my uh, um, queries you'd expect. This is Cal2, and Cal2 has been done on various different places. So it's moving from one location to another, and the heart, you can see the heart rate is slowly slowly rising. This is a given the last three options, and I was going to the uh, the uh, temporal value, so you can see the uh, you've got the uh, um, uh, uh, tuple tuple key value uh, um, uh, uh, entries. Now it's possible. I'll get get the uh, uh, to get more uh, information. Um, if I um, that's right. If I want to get um, anim animals of a uh, modified app, find out my. Uh, um, I can also add in things like um, I only want to get the uh, sex and heart rate, and I only want to get uh, values which are before a certain date. This is uh, currently a date in the future. If I send that, which should be a little bit quicker second time round. Um, uh, obviously. Uh, Performance will depend on how you actually set up a, uh, a proper system rather than the, um, uh, what, what I'm doing here. At the moment, yeah, you can see that took a year about. And it's giving me partial content. And the reason why it's giving me partial content is because there are, um, I'm asking for a page size of just two, uh, two uh, um, uh, animals. And of course, I've got more than two uh, uh, male animals in my uh, uh, system. So it's giving me more, it's saying, Yes, I've, I've returned uh, information, but there's more. If you want more, you're going to have to do something else. Now, um, this, is, as I said, uh, um, temporal information get very, very long. I mean, this is uh, only two entries. It's already 62 lines along here. Um, but it's given me some headers. Uh, and, in the, and the headers are saying things like, well, I have retrieved data within that range of dates. Uh, and I have also uh, can tell you, I know you've got two cows, but there's there's a pig one who's on my next page, and we can actually um, use him as a page anchor next time, which is saying I can start from the pig one, uh, and I'll go back to the body again. If I make another request and add in that page anchor to my request, I can say, okay, well, instead of getting cow one and cow two, can we start from pig one? Send that, or find out more information about the uh, the male animals on the farm. And it should return back an additional uh, um, uh, information. So you can restrict what you're after by saying, yes, I want this uh, animal, that animal. Now, you should realize that context brokers are potentially federated, they're potentially uh, uh, top of multiple systems. So there may be more animals in the farm than you would expect. Here's pig, you know, start after pig one, we did pig three, and pig one, you see, it's pig one, come back again. So we've got those information there. And if you look at the headers, this time it, it's saying, okay, We've got the next one's pig five. The previous one was cow one. Uh, and um, you can see overall there are 17 male uh, animals on the farm. Uh, so it's, uh, that is due to the count uh, options. So that was a little, little demo of uh, temple interfaces. Uh, pagination. Uh, this is more detail, de detail on it. You can uh, reduce the amount of information you're getting back primarily with last n. Last n reduces it to stuff which is recent. Obviously, typically context brokers are talking about the now. So uh, it's most likely that you're, uh, when you're talking about historic information, you want the last four or five, last two or uh, 20 uh, um, uh, responses. Page size just meant that I returned two animals rather than the uh, um, uh, default of 20. And of course, you can uh, change that. And I showed you uh, page anchor. If you put the options count, that will give you the uh, additional uh, header. Um, as you'd expect, this is a temporal uh, um, uh, interface. Therefore, you want to be able to do things like uh, a range of time or before an event or after an uh, event. There are a variety of parameters you can put in. Time at is the prim primary one. Um, time at is uh, assumed to be the current time if you're requesting a single uh, um, entity. If, however, you are requesting a, uh, um, a query, which is based on, say, the queue parameter, like you know, give me all the uh, uh, animals or give me all the male animals, 
uh, rather than just an individual cow, then you must explicitly uh, add in the uh, the time at value to work out what is going on. So uh, um, obviously you have before or after or between, and if you have uh, um, uh, between, you've got time at and end time at to uh, do the uh, other half of the, uh, the range. So this is just standard range uh, information. Um, as you would expect, it is perfectly possible to do anything you can do on an entity on a temporal entity. So it is perfectly possible to do a, uh, a geofenced query. You can add in the georel, the geometry, the co coordinates, which are uh, um, standard for finding the information. This particular uh, e example has a location and it's got a, a range of time. And you can see you can keep on adding in more and more properties. So you could add in uh, um, the uh, the queue parameter to get precisely the, the information which makes sense to you. This is how you would actually extract your data to get useful information, is that you want to be able to uh, push data out of the context broker so that you can then manipulate it and do the data uh, and deal with it as necessary. Temporal aggregation functions. Aggregated queries are uh, a new uh, area where you can basically push information to buckets. So instead of just getting what's the heart rate of my cow over time, you can say what, you know, what was the maximum rate uh, in uh, over the last minute, the previous minute, the minute before that. So there's a, there, there are a series of functions uh, which you can use using this aggregated functions or, uh, or uh, aggregated values method. Sorry, um, and you need to. If you use aggregated values, you need to have the methods and period. The methods is which uh, range functions you want to have. I'm having max and average. Uh, and the uh, um, uh, period is obviously how long it's going to be. This one's uh, uh, four minutes. Um, the parameters, obviously, the aggregated methods, a bit like the Atters method, um, aggregated methods uh, are a comma delimited list. And you can work out which functions there are. Currently, there's a list of about seven of them. Um, obviously, this potentially may increase if there's a, a need for uh, other uh, complex uh, functions, but you know, sum, average, min, max, that sort of thing. Now, um, for the duration, the duration uh, uh, NGSI LD follows the ISO 8601 standard. So um, it's letter P followed by a number, followed by years. Uh, followed by months, followed by days, and you can pick any any bits where you want. So the examples we've got there are you know, seven days or one and a half hours or four minutes. Uh, there's a special meaning for uh, uh, a period which is zero. In this case, I've given you zero seconds, but it could just as easily be zero days. Um, zero for context broker means since the start of time, because obviously you can't have a bucket which is uh, doesn't it doesn't exist. But you might want to find out what's the average overall for this particular value. So what happens when you, this comes out? You get, as you would expect, instead of uh, um, uh, tuplets, you've got triplets now. You've got what's the maximum value, and it's a from to range, from to range, from to range. And again, you've got the uh, um, uh, uh, as many functions as you've got. You can see that this particular one is just giving heart rate, but we could e easily get the, uh, other values as well. So, time series versus temporal interface. If you are using an NGSI v2 system, you haven't got a predefined temporal interface, and you haven't got a wide variety of choices as to what your context broker is. The, uh, the main uh, context broker offering NGSI v2 is Orion, um, and it has, it, it, it has not got the concept of Linked data, that's the whole point about this engine's ILD stuff. Now, um, obviously, it's uh, um, uh, out there already. It's you know, tried and tested, battle-hardened. It works, per works perfectly well. So there are other um, uh, um, generic enables which can be used for um, either time series information or uh, data persistence. I have... Uh, done uh, a couple of uh, NGSI v2 data persistence uh, um, uh, webinars, and you can see the, uh, uh, the the link here. It works perfectly well. Um, and of course, you can use uh, 
Cygnus Draco or, Co or Cosmos for your uh, uh, data persistence. Uh, they all have uh, inter all every single generic enabler has a an interface to um, uh, um, NGSI v2. It's you know it, it, it's it's out there. It's well uh, tried and tested. Now with NGSI LD, there are multiple uh, uh, brokers available, but obviously you don't really want to care about what's behind these uh, uh, databases. Uh, so these uh, context brokers, what database they're using, consider your context broker as a black box. Uh, but they now are offering this standard temporal interface. But again, uh, it is perfectly possible to uh, use Quantum Leap. And again, there's another uh, video we did with uh, getting data into Grafana um, uh, with uh, NGSILD. Uh, uh, Quantum Leap uh, supports NGSILD. Uh, uh, Cygnus LD, Draco LD, and Cosmos all offer. Um, an interface to NGSI LD, so you can also still use the data persistence uh, and uh, time series information if that's what you need. Question is, when do you need what and why? For time series data flow, what's actually happening is you have data in your context broker and the subscription is raised under a specific number of entities and attributes, and only that data is placed into your uh, um, timescale uh, database. Now, you can then use something like Grafana or any other uh, a business intelligence tool, knowledge, whatever, um, uh, to retrieve data from that uh, timescale database. So you're using the interface of timescale to get the information on the screen. So you can actually see a, uh, a line, line on the, uh, the map. You can see the cow's heart rate. You can see whatever's, whatever's going on. So in this case, it is internal to the um, smart system that there is a timescale database, and that is what you're using to get your data out. And it is also the case that it is only the entities and attributes as specified in your subscription which will end up in your database. Looking for uh, the temporal uh, in interface, it's a bit different because at this point, all entities and attributes are available. Now, this might not be what you're after. You might just be specifically wanting to get a, uh, a line on the graph because that's the, uh, um, uh, the uh, requirement and it's just for the one system. However, in that case, you should be using the time series web link, use your quantum leap component. Do not directly uh, talk from the database to your uh, uh, your system. This is uh, an anti-pattern because, as I said, you might have a, a system which uh, potentially would, would change. But think, you've got all the entities and attributes here. Now, going back to the uh, um, uh, smart farm scenario, if you're trying to extract value from your uh, devices on your animals, you might not know which attributes or which entities you really are interested in. Maybe the cows uh, um, move less in the rain. Maybe uh, there are certain fields where they are happy fro frolicking around and they're going to have a higher heart rate. You don't necessarily know what you're after beforehand, so it's safer to use a, a, a temporal uh, uh, system, uh, interface system, and then you can make complex queries. If, however, you just say, I just want to know what the rate of this cow, this cow is, uh, heart rate of this cow is, and uh, it's just for my own personal consumption, then we could uh, uh, still talk um, using uh, um, the uh, um, uh, quantum leap uh, uh, component. But don't uh, use the uh, um, uh, backing database uh, di directly if you're using uh, uh, temporal. Moving on to a more complex system, imagine instead I'm just having one farm, but I've now got a consortium of farmers. If they are federating their information, each system has got its own um, uh, um, context broker. It's got its own, potentially its own quantum leap or whatever. Um, and it, if you wanted to get information from multiple systems to work out you know, uh, which animals are affected by a disease or something like that, then it's, uh, the, your only choice here is to use the standard interface. You can't look inside the, uh, each individual uh, um, system and then uh, aggregate the information together. Um, obviously, um, 
you can display this uh, uh, display this as necessary. So, in summary, um, temporal uh, operations give context broker a historical memory context. Classically, a context broker is just interested in the now, but it now uh, has the option of being able to understand everything in the past. Um, it's an optional interface. It's not always needed. Uh, it's not always supported. If you can get away with less data uh, data storage, then uh, you can uh, um, uh, uh, go through other uh, other options. Most context brokers are currently supporting 131. Uh, obviously, 141 uh, on the Etsy spec is going to be uh, uh, arriving fairly soon. And uh, there are additional aggregation functions. In general, uh, use the interface when you can, uh, rather than using uh, um, uh, uh, a, 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 um, a generic enabler, because this will future-proof future your, uh, your, your use case and is useful for big data and federative queries. However, there are still plenty of use cases where you would want to use uh, existing uh, time series components which is when you are dealing with a known and limited set of entities and attributes. And obviously, uh, Quantum Leap is the only option you've got for NGSI v2. And it's a good uh, um, uh, for simple dashboards monitoring. And that is the end of the show, uh, everybody. Um, thank you very much uh, uh, for attending. I hope you've learned something, and I hope you uh, will have a good rest of your day. <laughs>